everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Maureen Ryan. I am the Deputy Director of the Center for 21st Century Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And we're very pleased here today, here, wherever we all are, to have 88.9 Radio Milwaukee's Tariq Moody and journalist Reggie Jackson here to talk to us about their new podcast called By Every, By Every Measure. It is a six part podcast on systemic racism focused on Milwaukee, but really about systemic racism across the country. Um, and our conversation today with Tariq and Reggie is going to be moderated by African and African Diaspora Studies Professor Anika Wilson. Um, I am going to moderate the chat as we go. So this is a little, if you've been with us before at a C21 event, this is a little bit different. Um, if you have a question at any point or a comment, something you want to throw into the mix, please leave it in the YouTube comments as it occurs to you. And I will jump in periodically to bring those questions into the conversation uh, that Anika um, Tarika and Reggie are having. So it will be kind of continuous throughout the event. And um, I think that's all you need to know from me. I will be here. I'm gonna turn it over now to the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies, Richard Grusin, to just tell you a little bit about what we do. Thanks Maureen. Um, welcome, am I live? Yes. Welcome to uh, C21. Just briefly for uh, People who may not be familiar with us, we're an interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary research center at uh, the university. And we are celebrating, uh, we celebrated in 2018, our 50th anniversary. Uh, we've been here pretty much since the beginnings of UWM. And what we try to do is to think about issues that are crucial to the 21st century, bringing in uh, scholars, community members, and others artists and so forth who are doing work that pertains uh, to issues of real concern today. And as we all know, there are a lot of them. Anyway, uh, if you're new to us, uh, check us out on our um, website. I think it's uwm.edu slash cd1 or c21, or just search c21 like the real estate company at UWM. Okay, so I'm pleased to uh, hand this over to Nate Imhoff of uh, 88.9, or Imig, sorry, Nate. And um, yeah, he'll introduce uh, his colleagues and ours. Thanks, Nate. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today. We are, we're very appreciative for the invitation to talk about the new podcast, By Every Measure. Uh, my role at the station is the director of content, and I've been with the station since 2011, and I've had the real privilege of watching the organization grow from, you know, a real scrappy kind of startup, non-commercial station in the uh, the basement of the MPS building, to a, a full functioning media company now. More than ten years later, we specialize in community stories, in music discovery. We do um, tons of podcasts on a weekly basis, and then we also produce longer form podcasts like this one. We've done video projects over the years celebrating Milwaukee. In fact, we had a film that was featured in the Milwaukee Film Festival that was, was kind of a compliment to this podcast. Um, a lot of the topics, there's a lot of crossover. The topic was, um, or the film was called Invisible Lines and it shared personal stories from 10 different Milwaukeeans of color and, and their experiences with prejudice and racism in the city. So this podcast kind of looks at the other end of that, the data and the solutions that are being um, developed here in Milwaukee and could be scaled to other cities. So we first got introduced to Reggie Jackson back in February, I believe it was, he was at our stations leading a conversation as part of our community engagement program called How to Have Better Conversations About Race. And I was in the audience that night and I was just really struck with um, just how brilliant Reggie is and the way that he uses data in, in a super straightforward and compelling way that is was really eye-opening to me and I think um, to our, our packed house we had in the studios that night for uh, a snowy February evening. So from there, we began, we began planning the podcast, and we knew we, that we really wanted to look at the data and the solutions. Um, because so often we, we, we talk about the problems and we talk about um, you know, all the issues and the disparities, but we kind of end the conversation there. So uh, Reggie has been guiding us through the history, and, and Tariq has been helping us understand better the solutions. 
So I've been um, just kind of the producer and the editor. Um, Tariq and Reggie really have been the big brains on this project. And I, I've learned so much from them. And uh, you're in for a really great discussion. These guys have been uh, so in this this conversation and, and so smart. And uh, we, I've really learned a lot. So look forward to the rest of this event today. And thanks again for the invitation. I think that's my cue. I don't know if I'm live yet. I don't know how to tell. I am. All right. Thank you guys so much for including me as, um, as part of this conversation. Again, my name is Anika Wilson. I'm the chair of African and African Diaspora Studies Department at uh, UWM. And uh, I've met Reggie before. This is my first time um, with having a talk with Tariq. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, what you guys are going to tell us today about uh, your work on this pod podcast by every measure. So I wonder if we can just uh, jump right in. And, um, and this is to either one of you to tell us a little bit about uh, how you got involved in this podcast, how you conceived of it, and why now? Well, I can start and then, and then we can go to Reggie about how he got involved. Um, most people think, oh, it's a, this podcast is a reaction to what happened in George Floyd or Jacob Blake. And to be honest, the, the actual idea started late last year. Um, 88.9, Nate, Nate's team decided they want to do kind of an annual original podcast series every year. The first one we did last year was a podcast called uh, Backspin, the search for Milwaukee's first hip hop song. So we got discussing what should we do for the next year or this year's podcast. Uh, so those discussions started late last year. And we started talking about initially, um, as you know, the election was coming around. I started seeing a lot of stuff about the racial wealth gap. And I said, well, this is a really interesting topic. Let's let's look at this initially. So the initial idea was surrounded by the racial wealth gap. But then we started seeing other things related to systemic racism. And we kind of pivoted towards systemic racism and looked at all the systems involved. So that's what it became. Uh, Nate came with the name by every measure. Uh, after New Year, we started kind of road mapping it out. We said, who should be part of this? Tariq, do you want to co-host? Yeah, who else should be part of it? And we remember that Reggie Jackson, we've been doing stuff with Reggie Jackson from Invisible Lines and kind of that event that Nate talked about. And so we invited Reggie Jackson to be part of it. Um, so that's how um, it came to be. So yeah, like most people think it's, it's because of now. It actually was a plan way before all what happened, before the pandemic, before George Floyd, before all of this, it just the timing was, you know, a coincidence. Yeah, and it kind of my involvement started with just a conversation with uh, Nate and Tariq about, you know, what should we talk about? What specific topics? And, you know, we brainstormed some ideas about different topics, um, bounced around some ideas about some additional people that could provide information related to it specifically, you know, in terms of solutions. And uh, we just, you know, we, we, we came up with the the plan and we just kind of jumped into it and started having conversations and and here we are now. I mean, we had no idea when we had that first conversation that this year would be what it is and that these would be topics that everybody would, would be talking about. But I'm really glad that that people are talking about these things. I'm really glad that the podcast has been helpful for so many people who haven't had access to this information before. And another thing, it was technically supposed to be finished summertime but the pandemic kind of put a like everything else put a delay on it so again all this timing it just happened to be at the right time you want to say it um with everything going on yeah i i, I love hearing about how this was such a long-term plan for you guys because sometimes um, i remember how i learned about uh civil rights for instance in, in grade school it was always like our oh, rosa park got tired she sat down and then you didn't know that, you know, no, it wasn't a moment, that, but they, but she was, they were ready for the moment. She was part of the NAACP. She was training people previously. She was a secretary up there. So it's, this is sort of reminds me of that in, in that uh, you guys haven't been waiting around for this moment, right? You were already engaged in this process and these conversations and then the timing coincided uh, with the, the resurgence of the, the Black Lives Matter movement, or I wouldn't say resurgence because it's been going steady, right? But um, more so the, the more widespread attention that the, the movement is, is getting. 
So can you guys talk a little bit about um, how you came to the table? Like what was your journey that got you here? Um, what are you bringing in from your experience, whether it's work or personal or whatever, that, that brings you to such a place of expertise in terms of being able to talk about systemic racism? Well, I'll let Reggie take this. He's the, he's the doctor here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I always tell people that for me, this, this is a very personal journey. I started my life dealing with segregation. The day I was born uh, in a little town in Mississippi, my mother and I had to go through the back door of the hospital. Um, and, you know, when I started to learn to swim, we had a separate swimming pool for the black and white kids in town. Um, so I started off dealing with segregation at very early age. I didn't really understand it. I, I mean, it was just, I was just a kid. Uh, moved to Milwaukee, um, and I didn't notice that Milwaukee was different from Mississippi in a very specific way. When I left Mississippi in 1973, my last year of school there was second grade. I had white classmates in Mississippi. Came to Milwaukee from third through eighth grade, not a single white classmate from third through eighth grade. First time I had white classmates in Milwaukee was in 1979 when I went to Milwaukee Tech, I caught the city bus all the way to the south side. So to me, it, it's a personal journey of learning by experiencing things and in terms of the history. The reason that I'm so invested in the history is because I've traced my family's history. And when I'm telling the stories of what happened with slavery, I know the name of the family that enslaved my family in Mississippi. I've been to the land, I have soil from the land that my ancestors walked on as enslaved people. Um, I've seen the last will and testament of the family that owned my family giving away my family members mm -hmm. to their children and grandchildren. Uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to spend six years in the military and be able to spend time traveling around the world and see really how good we have it in the United States, but recognizing that all of us don't have it so good in the United States. And I've always loved history since I was a little boy, always interested. Uh, I used to read encyclopedias for fun when I was a little boy. So I was kind of nerdy, but I always wanted to know stuff. And, and one of my favorite topics was history. And so when I became involved with America's Black Holocaust Museum back in 2002, that gave me kind of the vehicle to talk about the history that I had learned. And over the course of time and growing out of that work, that volunteer work with the museum, uh, started my own company, Nurturing Diversity Partners, and traveling around the country, talking about these issues and really using historical context to help people understand how we got to where we are. That's kind of the vehicle that I use. I think it's important that we talk about things and learn the things that we didn't learn in history class. None of us learn these things in history class. And none of us are gonna learn these in history class because they're not teaching them in any schools. They're not even teaching them in colleges for the most part. So you need vehicles like these podcasts to get this information out. And I'm just really uh, excited to be able to share what I've learned you know, I always said that, you know, learning stuff without sharing it is just really kind of it's stupid for you to learn it if you're not going to share with other people. Um, I guess my journey, I guess it's not that dissimilar from Reggie. I am also from the South. Uh, I spent most of my life in Atlanta, uh, lived all over the Southeast. Um, doing this podcast with Reggie kind of brought up kind of all the things I dealt with with racism and seeing my parents, what they did with racism. So throughout the podcast, you might hear personal stories that I remember my parents telling me or what I've dealt with for like, for example, in the uh, housing episode, we we're talking about how the GI Bill was meant to help all the GIs, but with exception of black people who were left out of that opportunity. And I remember my dad dealing with that, um, trying to get their first house. He couldn't get the GI loan. He was a veteran. I'm a veteran, just like Reggie, but he couldn't get it. But luckily, uh, the developer, the house owner, um, for whatever reason, was desperate to sell the house, made a deal with my dad. He got the house, his first house, and probably the first house in his family. You know, my dad's probably first person also to go to college. That allowed him to roll into another house, another house that gave us a certain uh, mobility that probably we wouldn't have had if he didn't get that, that opportunity in Louisville, Kentucky, where I was born. So just the journey and looking back at all the experiences I went through, um, I got to share those stories. And I saw how my personal stories relate to all this data and and systems that we have been discussing on this podcast. And so, and, and that sort of brings me to my next question about system, because you can talk about, um, and you can study racism, you can tell different types of stories about racism, but you guys are really focused on systemic racism. Um, so can you talk about, tell, tell us a little bit about like, um, why the focus on systemic racism and what are the sort of difficulties of telling stories about systemic racism? 
I think systemic racism is interesting because I think most people don't understand the difference between individual racism and systemic racism. That's why we did, instead of going to the individual system, we did a primer called Systemic Racism 101, which is the first episode. So we can go right into the individual systems because we felt that people really didn't understand or actually specifically if you're not black or uh, brown, you don't really experience it. So if you don't see it, therefore you don't, you don't think it exists. So we wanted to start off with the explanation of systemic racism, explain it's different than an individual acts of racism, individual for someone saying the N word or whatever, this is more nefarious. This is more intentional. This is policies, governments, uh, institutions, banks that created these policies over time, whether it's health or education, and I think most people don't realize that. And we wanted to show, tell stories, but also back it with data. Because a lot of people, you know, won't believe it. Because as we, we talked about, Regin talked about this. When we talk about history, American history in our schools gave America kind of this rosy look, right? You know, there was slavery, the Civil War, civil rights, MLK, and everything's great. That's what most school history look at, right? They don't really go into the nuances of what happened between all those milestones so we wanted to look at those milestones deeper and look at the data behind it to really illustrate that systemic racism has played a huge role in disparities specifically between black and brown people in this country i don't know if one of reggie wants to add to that yeah you know the interesting thing is is when people think of racism they always think of individual acts of bigotry they don't think of systemic racism because they never heard of it before so part of, of what we try to, to show people, just as Tariq said, is how these institutions, policies, practices play a role. And most importantly, and this is the part that people don't like to say out loud, but I like to say it out loud because I think it's important, is that these systems set up advantages for white people and disadvantages for non-white people. It was done very purposeful. I mean, it wasn't an accident that we have home, home ownership gaps it wasn't an accident that the schools don't work the same in the black community, in the brown community as they do in the white community. None of these things are accidental. And the most important thing for people to understand is that it doesn't matter who's in those institutions, the system is set up so that it replicates those same outcomes over and over and over again, you know, year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation. And that's the most hurtful part about it is that it's a never ending process. We can talk about systemic racism from a hundred years ago but it's still occurring today. And it, it's, it's an unbroken chain of disadvantages for people of color and advantages for white people that they don't know they have because they've been taught that the reason they're so far ahead of everybody else is because the Protestant work ethic. They've worked harder, they've been smarter. They've done all of the right stuff and the other people just haven't. You know, they pulled themselves up by the bootstraps when they came here from Poland or Germany or wherever. And, and I always like to say, well, listen, it's great that you came over with some boots and somebody gave you some bootstraps. We didn't even get boots. So we got here and we're still waiting to get some boots. So how are we going to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we don't have boots? And every time we try to get them, somebody snatches it away from us. And a really cool thing that I wanted to do, a lot of people like using Martin Luther King quotes, I have a dream, all the ones they know about. But Martin Luther King had a lot of other things he said to address this, talking about exactly what Reggie said about the bootstraps. He actually mentioned that in a quote about, you know, the Homestead Act which gave a lot of land to a lot of white families. 98% of the land in Homestead Act went to white families. And he mentioned like all the grants, college land grants. And basically, just like Reggie said, Martin Luther King Jr. actually said, white people got the hookup basically and left us out. And basically Martin Luther King was marching Washington to get their check. Most people leave out that quote. They always talk about, I have a dream. I want little children together. But I'm okay recognize the unfair policies that were in place. And most people in our history books eliminate that, those quotes from uh, class as well. So we actually intentionally, thanks to Nate, to add those quotes throughout these episodes to highlight, yes, Martin Luther King Jr. also recognized this. He also said, I have a dream, but he also said, "You all, this country has been unfair to black people. Yeah, I always like to tell people, I'm sorry, Nika, listen, when, when you want to hear the I have a dream speech, if you Google it, Google full I have a dream speech, not the part with the I have a dream because that was even supposed to be part of his speech that day. But he he talked about a lot of stuff that people don't know we talked about as Tariq said, and he said that America has written a check to, to black people that came back marked insufficient funds. And that's the part that's left out because that's the part that that's the honest part 
that America doesn't want to want to live with. They want to just think, well, you know, Dr. King was about, you know, just coming together and judging each other by the, you know, content of our character, all that. No, listen to what he, he wrote, the speech that he wrote. Because if you look, if you watch the speech, you, you watch the video of the speech, you'll see that when he's at the I have a dream part, he's not reading from that paper anymore. He's actually holding it in his hand. So that's a critical part of how we whitewash the memory of Dr. King. I, I like the way you guys bring up not just uh, the, the black disadvantages that have been created by these systems, but also kind of like entitlement programs, but not entitlement programs like we usually like to think of them, but as a white entitlement programs, right? That, that created systems that gave away a lot of benefits to, to uh, white. You can, call it, you can call it affirmative action, basically. Yeah. Affirmative yeah. action, right? No, I'm just That's trying exactly to all the buzzwords and, and shift <laughs> <out>. <laughs> affirmative action works and uh, entitlement programs work, right? Right, because that's a bigger bulk. That's a bigger giveaway than anyone probably ever got in some kind of welfare check, right? I call it the white folks welfare system in full effect. That's my name for it. All right, so we all got names. Rick, you have any special names? <laughs> Um, but so what you guys are, are making me think about is one thing you keep talking, you talk about Martin Luther King, you talk about how he was talking about the same problems, right? We're talking about the same problems now that we're talking about then. Um, so I guess my question is, um, I just want to hear a little bit more about this sort of generational issues that you guys bring up in the podcast. So what are the generational effects of um, all of these systems? And how can you deal with systems that are so um, long-standing, ingrained, institutionalized, right? Um, so I guess a little bit of, of, about uh, the generational impact and also about um, how your podcast addresses the, the issue of solutions, which I've heard brought up. How do you, how, what kind of solutions do we hear are, are people working on right now for, for these kinds of um, systemic issues? So just to begin with, uh, doing this podcast, Hanger Reggie, I, I, I've been in a rabbit hole learning a lot. The one thing we talk about, a lot of people, again, avoided in history was the Kerner Commission Report, Lyndon B. Johnson's Commissioner's Report to look at why these riots were happening back in 1967. So we commissioned all these, mostly white men, I think all white men for this commission, to look at the real reason behind it. And Lyndon B. Johnson was hoping to be something nefarious or something like that. But the report came back over 50 years ago, said the same things we're saying today on this podcast over a generation ago. The br police brutality, the, the lack of unfair housing, the unfair funding of education, all those things were in a government report, but they had recommendations and they had ideas, solutions to look at that. But the country, mostly the white Americans, did not like those solutions. And those solutions were discarded and forgotten, right? So, and we're basically repeating history. So I just want to bring up, like, I learned a lot of that and we brought that a lot into the, into the podcast. But as far as solutions, we frame the podcast in every episode where Reggie talks about how do we get here? Whether it's education, housing, racial wealth gap, policing. Then we want to interview people locally or nationally looking at who's trying to, what organization is trying to dismantle these systems and what are they doing? Because we want to bring we don't want you to sit there, like listen to it and get just mad and angry and like feel hopeless, right? Uh, we want you to at least think there, there's people out there, organizations trying to change it and you can help like, maybe get involved in some way or, or another. We want people to come away feeling like there may be a chance to dismantle these systems if we really tried and like uh, talk to these people, talk to these organizations, volunteer for these organizations, donate to these organizations. So that's the goal of this. So we want to always have a call to action out of every episode of this podcast. I don't Do you know want to add anything, Reggie. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's incredibly important to understand that these are things people have been talking about and fighting against for such a long time. It, you know, the struggle is real, as people like to say. And there are incredible people in Milwaukee that are doing just phenomenal work. There are incredible people nationally that are doing incredible work that we don't hear about. You know, we hear about the bad stuff all the time. We hear about the problems. We don't hear about the solutions 
you know, one of, one of my favorite organizations here in Milwaukee dealing with housing discrimination is the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council. This is a phenomenal organization, wonderful people that I've gotten to know over the last several years that are doing just tremendous work that nobody even knows about. Nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows uh, the fact that they are underfunded consistently every year, but still turn out just tremendous work working on housing discrimination, which is one of the biggest issues we have here in Metro Milwaukee. And so uh, I think it's important, as Tariq said, for people to understand what the organizations are and then to find a way to support them, whether you're volunteering with them or providing some financial resources. Because, I mean, that, that's the key to change happening is having people like those individuals that were part of the podcast that talked about solutions. Those are people that I call change agents. Those are the people that are leading us in the direction of, okay, we know this is a big problem, uh, but we can work on it. You know, I, I use the example of, of somebody, this is what we, we typically do as Americans, right? We, we see a big gigantic iceberg out in the ocean, right? And we get in a little bitty rowboat and we take a hammer and chisel out there and we start chiseling away at it. And we come back home, we say, man, we're doing some really, really excellent work on that iceberg, but it's never going to happen, right? It, you need a boatload of other people to come out with little chisels and little hammers and you get enough people working on it, then guess what? You can start to chip away at that iceberg. And that's literally what's happening. And there's so many people that are doing the work that you don't know behind the scenes. And the podcast has been able to bring some of those people uh, to the public's attention, which is a wonderful way of engaging people in organizations that they probably never even heard of before. And a good example is uh, our final episode, which comes out Monday on health. Uh, we actually talked to three people or organizations uh, as far as solutions. One at the government level, at the city level, two at the corporate level, um, and three at the educational institutional level. Um, so first we talked to Lillian Payne of the Milwaukee City Health Commission uh, about what they're doing at their level when it comes to health disparities and systemic racism in health. Uh, and then we talked to Freighter, who has a program called End Racism. And what, what, are, what the medical you know, because there are issues of medical bias, what they're doing and how they're tackling it. And then finally, we talked to MIT. Now, on a national level, they have a program called In Hacking Racism, and they're doing one up coming next on healthcare. So they're inviting all types of people from the corporate level to the, to the government level, education, to look at solutions to these problems, whether it's medical bias, whether it's clinical trials, whether it's representation. So they're doing it at that kind of level. I'm really looking forward to that one because it really takes the solution in different sectors. And that comes out next Monday. I'd like to say something about one of the people you mentioned, Lillian Payne. And people in Milwaukee don't know this, but when Milwaukee County uh, decided to issue uh, you know, a statement that racism is a public health crisis, you know, we heard that you know, Chris Abley and the Milwaukee County Board of Supervisors was, were the ones that came up with that. They didn't. That was Lillian Payne. That was her baby. She created that. She pushed for that. And so she doesn't get the credit she deserves. But, you know, I always like to acknowledge the role that she played in that. She is the architect of that, you know, uh, statement that was issued. Uh, had it not been for her pushing it, it would have never happened. So got to give her a shout out. She's phenomenal. I'm going to jump in, actually. We have a question from Lane Hall on the subject of institutions. Uh, Lane Hall is in the chair of the English department. Uh, here at UWM. And he asks, what would your call to action be for an institution like UWM? In other words, what specific ways can we dismantle our own systemic racism within higher ed? And maybe Anika, you are moderator and also part of UWM. If you want to speak to some of that, um, you'd be welcome to. Or we could just jump to, to answers. Well, I, I don't know, Anika or Reggie wants to start. Well, sure, I, I can start. You know, we, we work, my company, Nurture Diversity Parties, we work with a lot of institutions. And one of the things that we tell people is that you have to start at the ground floor. You have to really um, use what, what we've learned from an, an organization called the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. It's a consortium of 175 different municipalities from around the country that are looking at problems in their communities with a racial equity lens. And one of the things that they teach is that you have to look at what your organization does in terms of do you play a role in the disparities you see? And if you are a part of it, then you have to craft solutions and you have to start by looking at the data. So if you're saying that, you know, UWM doesn't have enough professors of color in this department or whatever, you know, whatever the issue may be, you have to look at your data first. 
then you know, okay, you know the extent of the problem, and then you can craft a solution. You can begin to put teams of people together to work on it, creating a goal, and then you track that goal. Because this is what a lot of people do. A lot of people want to jump into equity work without understanding, you know, where they are right now. You have to get a baseline to understand where you are so that as you are making progress or not making progress, you can actually measure that. And I don't think a lot of organizations are willing to do that because taking that hard look in the mirror at where you are is really kind of difficult for some people, but it's really quite necessary. Uh, and then making sure that you have uh, really, if you don't have this, it's never going to work. If you don't have the people at the top of the organization that are really, really invested in it, it's not going to work. It's just going to be, you know, checking the box and it's going to sound good. You know, you can send out a newsletter, PSA, whatever, look at what we're doing. But if the, if the top people in the organization aren't pushing it, then the people in the organization are going to realize like, man, it, it doesn't seem like we're really all that serious about it. So that's the approach that we, we push is to use the tools that GEAR has, has given us in the racial equity toolkit they developed, which teaches every municipality. That's the approach that you start with, looking at your, your data, seeing where you are. And if you are involved in maintaining those disparities, it's your duty as a municipality to work on doing something about it. As an institution, it's your duty uh, to do something about it. I want to let the guests speak first. Tariq, did you did you want something to say? I can just speak from what I know about UWM, but it's also interesting to hear about, um, you know, from different people in the community or working in the community, what what they want to see from UWM, right? Like, what's the um, sort of reputation of our university in the community with regards to how we how we serve the Black community? how we're dealing, how we support our, our students of color, all of those things are sometimes we have a kind of internal view. We have, a, we have data, Reg, we have like so much data about, you know, low graduation rates after six years for students of color, people who accumulate a lot of debt and never leave with a degree, uh, low and falling numbers of, of, of black faculty. I mean, there's faculty of color, but black faculty that's, where the numbers are really in the um, in the gutter right now, um, but I, I wanted to hear a little bit more about from from you guys before I, I start to speak to some of the things that I would like to see. Because again, I don't think this is about me. But um, well, I guess I I didn't go to a PWI, which is predominantly white institution like UWM or Madison. I went to HBCU, mm -hmm. so I guess why. I like to see, and I see some schools, PWI is doing it, collaborating with HBCUs to learn, right? I think that is very important to get that perspective um, and like have cross collaboration, cross learning, cross professors. You know, I think that is a very useful thing for a school like UWM to take part in. Um, just the fact that I learned like my requirement in, at HB at Howard, I had to take a, a black di African diaspora course. That was a requirement. I don't think that's a requirement at UWM or, or Madison or, or I'm from Atlanta, Georgia Tech or UGA. Like learn from those schools and understand maybe the structure of HBCUs and bring that into UWM as well and have some cross learning, you know. So that's just some of my ideas, I think, just from my perspective, going to HBCU which I, I personally highly recommend students that look like me attend HBCU at least some part of their college careers. Because that experience really, really you know, like helped me a lot to, to develop me who I am today. Because I'm like, or not, one of the things we talked about in an education episode is about the fact of representation matters, the lack of black teachers. I didn't have a black teacher till I went to Howard, <laughs> right? I went to a mostly white high school in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, because my parents, you know, unfortunately realized I want my son to have a better education. So they moved to a neighborhood predominantly white to get that education because we talked about it. White schools have better funding because of how it's funded. So we went to a school that has probably a very high national uh, reputation, you know, in, out of Atlanta. So I think dealing of having a collaboration bring as you said bringing people from the community learning from hbcus those kind of programs 
is uh, is crucial um, to help with this this issue of systemic racism inside institutions like UWM or Madison. Yeah, and I, I would say, I mean, I, I totally agree with you that it's important for students of color to see professors of color. Um, and that is not something that I think that we do well at all. I think that uh, we're, we're so few and far between that, um, you know, students are sort of like clamoring for, for, uh, for attention when there's not, not enough of you to go around. And some of they're concentrated in certain areas mm -hmm. and you can see them in others. Um, and so that's a problem. I love being in a black studies department, but I know that like at one time there were, I think we did a report in 2017, there were nine black faculty in the college's letters and science and five of them were in our department, right? So what does that tell you about the experience that students are having outside of our particular department? So that's a problem. And I think that, this, I think it takes two things. I think it takes well, maybe three things. It takes um, intentionality. So the thing with Reggie is talking about where you look at your data, where are we, where are we failing? You know, um, you look where we're failing and then you look at the systems that perpetuate that failure. How can we do, how can we do better hires or how can we take care of what is causing our students to be delayed or not graduate at all? Then you put resources to that. And I think that that has to be, all of those things have to be in place. I mean, you have to be held accountable. You have to make those goals and hold yourself accountable. And I am just waiting to, to see that happen. I'm waiting to see the results because I think when you want those things to happen, they can happen. And I think that the past has borne this out. We've had programs before that were, where resources were set aside to hire uh, people of color, right? So when we had those programs, those things happened. When those programs went away because of a budget problem, those things didn't happen. So are we saying that it only matters when we're not having a budget crisis, that diversity only matters when the money is flowing? So I think that's something we have to look at. So what, what do we decide? We decide doesn't matter anymore because now we have a budget problem. You know, Black people always have a budget problem. So I think the biggest thing the takeaway was a recent story um in npr about Citigroup did a study and realized this country lost <clears throat> last 20 years lost 16 trillion dollars of wealth of money you know that this issue is not a black or brown problem this issue is an american problem this affects us all and i think hopefully this podcast will realize that this is not isolated to one group mm -hmm. but you know financially this affects everybody right and the uh, best way I, I understand it, it's kind of like, a, um, I kind of use this an analogy a lot. Excuse me, you have a bad heart, right? But everything else in your body is great. So imagine that's the country, your body's the country and your heart is African-Americans and your heart is bad, but your body's great. You're like, I'm good, just my heart's bad. But eventually if you ignore that, that heart condition is gonna expand to other parts of your body and affect you, you get a stroke, right? So that's the same thing with this country. You know, we need to realize that this is not just a black or brown problem. This is an American problem. And I think that's what we're trying to convey in this podcast. I'm gonna jump in with another comment and a question that's on this topic still. Um, the comment is from BLC Field School, which I, if I were to make an educated guess, would say is actually our colleague in architecture, Arijit Sen. Um, and the comment is UWM lawyers and HR officers Offer HR offers incorrect advice to faculty hiring committees. I was on one and can vouch for that. They seem to suggest that ensuring racial equity is illegal, which it's not. UWM needs to take some difficult decisions. Having a $10,000 grant to consider equity and holding three roundtables are absolutely not enough and acceptable responses. So that's something about the UWM situation. Um, and we have another comment about a different kind of institution. Um, Bill Wood asks, I'd be interested to hear from Reggie about how museums can be more involved in education focused on these issues. American Black Holocaust Museum is a special case and does important work, but what about other museums maybe that aren't specifically um, about the Black experience or about African-American culture? Oh, it's great. Thank, thank you for that, Bill. You know, Bill's a, a colleague. We worked together uh, some stuff with America's Black Holocaust Museum for a number of years. Bill has been just super valuable uh, you know, 
person to, to provide us really great information about how to, to, to make the museum more effective. And, and one of the things that I wrote an article for a museum journal recently, um, and I talked about that specific issue that you know, museums have to change what they are. We, we're in a, a time where around the world, people are talking about issues that they've never talked about before, right? We're talking about systemic racism all over the world, not just in the US. And museums have usually been a place where you go to have this pleasant experience and you watch the, you know, the exhibits that they have and learn about how wonderful, you know, I, I can remember as a kid going to the Milwaukee Public Museum and seeing old Milwaukee, right? And I'm thinking like, man, that, that seemed like such a wonderful place. But as I got older, I realized it wasn't such a wonderful place for black folks and, and, and you know, for Latino folks, and certainly not a good place for Native American folks. And I think museums have to be more honest than they've been. They have perpetuated the myth of America, and it's time for them to step up to the plate because when people go to museums now, they want a different experience, right? They don't want to just go in and see these tired exhibits. They need to have some interactivity. And one of the great things about America's Black Holocaust Museum, uh, when I first volunteered there back in 2002 and became one of the griots, you know, people normally call the people that give you tours docents at most museums. We use griot, which is a term we borrow from West Africa. Those are the people who are the oral historians that keeps of the history. And the griots there would literally take you on a journey through through the last 500 years of history for African people, beginning with what African people were doing before the transatlantic slave trade began. What was the middle passage journey like across the Atlantic Ocean? What was it like when you got here, when you were sold? What that whole journey was like? So we literally uh, were taking people on a journey. And when I gave my tours, and I was a Saturday group, I was there every Saturday in 2002 through 2008. What I did is I told people that you are going to be the people I'm talking about. You are going to be the people who were living in Africa, who were the kings and queens and, and did different things together. You're going to be the people who came in those ships. You're going to be the people who were transported on those ships and have them understand that you're experiencing what these people experience. And I think that that's what museums are trying to do. You know, one of the, the, the great things about America's Black Holocaust is after it closed, and we, we started to reestablish it. One of the first things we did was create the virtual museum, the online museum, which has been online since 2012. And what happened is we realized that we could still have a museum without walls. And this virtual museum, which is at abhmuseum.org, was really the first of its kind in the US, the first virtual museum. And now because of COVID, everybody's like, we have to figure out how to do stuff virtually. But we were way ahead of the curve understanding that you could reach a broad audience. We had visitors from 200 countries visit that virtual museum. Millions of people visit the museum uh, 24 hours a day. And that is a space that museums have to be in, but they have to really be more honest. They have to stop you know, telling people how wonderful George Washington was without telling you about the warts that George Washington had. You know, we have to be more honest and inclusive. And to me, the biggest thing that's missing from most Americans understanding of African-American history is we learn about the Civil War. We learn about you know, the 13th Amendment. And then the next thing we hear about is Rosa Parks not giving up her seat on that bus, right? We're missing 90 years of history, 90 ugly years, 90 horrific years that were really much more impactful than most people give credit to. And a lot of the disparities and stuff we're talking about, the genesis for those disparities started over those 90 years. And so we have to do a better job as museums of being honest, even if it hurts people's feelings. I'm sorry, Black people's feelings have been hurt for a long time. It's time for some other people to feel some pain. I did want to mention that I was, uh, a museum reached out to me, um, the Chipstone Foundation. Do you know, do you know them, Reggie? I'm not familiar with them at all. Yeah, um, they reached out to me. They have some um, exhibits, made some, uh, furniture and various things. And they said like, look, we have some things that were made by African-Americans. We have an expert on, um, you know, using a material archives to talk about African-American history. Would you like us to come and talk to your class? And I was like, okay, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So um, I think that is like a museum who is trying to, I mean, it's another idea, like they're gonna teach, right? They're gonna, um, they're going to have these material objects. We're going to do a virtual thing. This is just an Altera cup. And, uh, you know, use that space to, I mean, use that, their materials to reach out to the community instead of waiting for people to come 
into the space. And this was something that they were reaching out to me about before the um, before the pandemic hit us. So it's just interesting, like some of the things I see museums and this one in, is not in particular focus, doesn't have a particular focus on African-Americans, right? But um, seeing the, uh, creating a different role for itself. So I think that was a, an interesting thing um, to, to add to that, that last segment. Richard, did you do wanna um, add something? Actually, I just wanted to pay more attention, but yeah, we've we've had some uh, contact in the past with Chipstone as well. I think that they're pretty valuable. I guess what I was interested in asking, if I can shift this just a little bit, sort of coming off of your uh, last comment, Anika, is whether uh, Tariq and Reggie, what they think has been gained by this shift to virtual sociality that we are all engaged in, and what's so interesting is that we find where we do have, I think, real collectivity now is not like at a sporting event or not at a concert or something like that, but it's actually in the streets. So we have a kind of strange, almost dialectic now between this distributed kind of virtual social gathering that we're engaged in and then and in really an intensification of gathering on the streets. So I don't know, I've been struck by that and wonder what either of you might have to say. Well, I have this, I have discussions about this and I've asked questions in other interviews. And I, I always think it's like COVID-19 maybe had a silver lining, right? Sports is canceled, all this is canceled. So people got nothing else to pay attention to other than the issues. Like I always thought if George Floyd happened where there's no COVID-19, where we, would we be where we are now? Will we see Netflix giving a hundred million dollars? Will we see all these articles and think pieces and companies and corporations giving money and investing in all these diversity issues if it wasn't for the pandemic shutting down everything? You know, I think personally, the pandemic has a lot to do with it. You know, you don't have the distractions, normal distractions. You couldn't go to the bar. You couldn't go to a restaurant. You can't go to a baseball game. You couldn't go to a football game. There were no football games, no theater, no movies. All you had was social media and what was going on. That's all. And I think more people started paying attention to it because of the pandemic. And I guess you can call that sort of a silver lining, unfortunately. It's sad that it took a pandemic for people to actually like, oh, what happened to George Floyd is terrible. You see protests in every state alaska you know places where you don't think there's a there's a lot of black people people are protesting those states 200 countries protesting right i don't think that would have happened if we didn't have uh this pandemic that's true we better be careful though because next thing you know we're gonna hear right wingers say that uh covid was a you know conspiracy by a blm or by the left in order to create this stuff Anyway, but I think I agree with you, though. I think it's right that that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and, you know, uh, the other the other thing I think about this is that COVID is so it creates all this isolation for a lot of people. Not everybody, but for a lot of people, there's this this isolation. And then I, I think that, and maybe this is just personal, you know, my own personal experience of it, right? Um, that when you are suffering these blows time and time again, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, you know, Ahmed Aubrey, over and over, and you know, and of course, this is this is, is this is ongoing. You don't always have the same outlets for, you know, you're not having all the same opportunities to process these things together with people, and in a sense, like the spilling out onto the street to me is like an eruption of that. Like you can't. You just can't contain it in your home, in your house, on the screen, right? That this is a kind of um, something that, that requires some type of actual physical getting together for a lot of people. Because um, it's, it's, I think it's a very rough thing to, to try to process that in isolation and to yeah. onto it in isolation. Yeah, I agree. It, it's much more difficult to deal with things because we're so isolated now. You know, it, it reminds, you know what Tariq said uh, about, you know, where we would be had it not been for COVID if George Floyd would have would have been murdered the way he was. I don't, there's absolutely no way we'd be where we are without COVID, right? And, and one of the interesting things, I was thinking about this a couple of days ago, 
is I was watching uh, an old radio program, right? I was just doing some research on something. I found this old radio program. And, and I remember back in the day before we had television, guess what people did? They sat around the radio and they listened. How many people listen, right? We, we've gotten out of the habit of listening, right? So this has given people a space to learn how to listen again. I mean, things like podcasts. People are reading more books than they've read in their entire lives, I think, right? You know, everybody is trying to find a book to help them on equity issues and learn about all these different things. So I think that it's putting Americans back into a really good space where we're becoming something that we had gotten away from. We're becoming intellectuals again. We're actually trying to learn things above and beyond getting out of school. Because, I mean, how many people still try to learn once they get out of school? You know, you graduate from high school, man, I'm not going to read another book the rest <laughs> of my life. Right? I hear people say that. Get out of college, man, I'm never going to write another paper. I'm never going to, you know. But people are doing that. They're literally, you know, my, my, one of my best friends used to tell me, she said, Reggie, you do more homework than anybody I know who's not in school. And a lot of people are doing homework, right, because they want to know, just as Tariq said. He's gone down that rabbit hole trying to learn. And I think that it's really created something that's very unique because a lot more people are engaged in wanting to learn. And the things that they're learning are things that they would have never learned otherwise. You know, you, you talk about the study of all of these issues that we talk about on the podcast. People have written phenomenal works on these things. There's great documentaries, a lot of places you can go and learn about these things. And believe me, I don't believe that had we not been in the pandemic, and certainly had George Floyd not been murdered, we would not be in this space where we're having these conversations Why? I mean, the podcast would have happened regards, right? Because we planned this a while before all of this, but the general public would not have been engaged in it. And I think that it's put a lot of pressure on people to, to say, man, maybe I don't know enough. I need to learn some stuff. And I'm hoping that, that you know, UWM and, and, and museums and, and other institutions take that to heart and realize like, listen, these are things that people want to learn about. Start pushing these things and, and putting resources behind these things because we haven't done it. But now I think it's absolutely mandatory that we push these things and make them not just, you know, something we check off the box, but say, listen, we're going to put our, our, our money where our mouth is. You know, it's great to talk the talk, but are you going to walk the walk? And, and I've said in one of the articles I wrote for my column, I said, I'm glad that a lot of people are woke right now, but are you going to get out of the bed? Because being woke is one thing, but getting out of bed is something else, you know. So I think we're helping people to 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 learn how to get out of that bed. I I like this discussion about um, different types of media that people are are consuming now or in different measure. Because I I think one of the things that surprised me in recent years is just how popular podcasts are. You know, I just assumed everybody was going to be streaming, looking at things, movies, video clips, Quibi, whatever. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking, and I know that was a big failure. But um, <laughs> what? No, it was great. I subscribe. No, kidding. no, but just my point is just that that like something that seems more sort of on the low tech end of things, right? Like it's it's it just like radio, right? That people are 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 embracing that or, or you are learning from that or want to listen to stories and voices and experiences of other people and that you guys are kind of taking advantage of something which to me is very surprising like the rise of the, the podcast um and i just wanted to hear more about the kind of responses that that you guys have been receiving so far from people like you're, you're out here trying to teach we want people to learn something to drum into people's head or shift the whole paradigm about what racism is, which is, which is like a very long struggle because for years and years, you know, advocates and um, researchers, academics, we've all been saying that racism is not about individual slights. Um, it's about these systems. Um, and this is the job that you guys are trying to do. So, so far, what are the kind of responses that you're hearing to um, your podcast. You're already five episodes complete, from what I understand. Yeah, the last one comes out Monday. Overall, the the I'm actually shocked. You know, being the the, the climate of the business we are, I about 99 percent of the of the comments have been really good, positive. I mean, there's people who have said they cried. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wanted to. I love Reggie because he tells great stories when he uses data, but I think. The fact that we wanted to make it sure, I wanted to reinforce that I don't want people to be defensive. I know how people, when you say white privilege, people take a, a, a defense is like, you're attacking me. Like yeah. we're not attacking any individual. 
like in the policing episode, we made it clear this is not about an individual police officer. This is about a system that was placed over time and built. We want people to dismantle that system. We want to make sure that when we convey our emotions, our anger, this is not about an individual. And I think a lot of times on social media, of course, social media doesn't do a good job of communicating, even though it's called social, people take things out of context. And so we wanted to use the podcast as a way to say, just listen to the stories and understand this is not about you. This is about history and understand this, right? And I think that approach to how Reggie does it and how I did it with asking the questions and bringing up personal stories along with the data resonated with a lot of people because it wasn't like, hey, Joe Smith did this or Bob did this or Karen did this. We weren't talking about the Karens, right? We're talking about the institutions in place, the history, where it came from. I think that resonated a lot of people. and We got a lot of great comments. I mean, I remember we got one guy like basically saying brought to tears, you know, learn or not, you know, I heard people like using this to talk to their families, right? So I think the, the results have been really positive. And the fact that the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation interviewed Reggie about it, you know, that's, that says a lot. And I know Reggie probably could probably talk about some of the uh, responses that he's gotten. Yeah, you know, it's been all positive. Uh, you know, not only did the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation reach out to me after hearing the podcast, I just recently got an email from someone from the Belgian news channel who wants to interview me now because of the podcast. And everything that I heard from people in terms of their feedback, you know, I, I post links to to the podcast on my Facebook page. And, you know, so many people have responded and saying, man, this has been phenomenal. I've learned so much. I have a different perspective than I had before. Now I get how we got where we are. I understand things in more depth. Uh, and, and I think kind of the way that the podcast is done, just as Tariq said, it's not, it's not shaming and blaming anybody. It's just sharing, you know, this is just what it is, right? And so when people can be in that frame of mind where it's like, okay, I'm going to just listen to this and I don't have to have this defensiveness because if you're defensive, you're probably not going to listen to podcasts in the first place. But people who are, are you know, more inclined to want to learn, they're going to sit, they're going to listen. And, and what it leads to, and this is one of the core principles I live by, is that it leads to people having more productive conversations moving forward. When you know stuff, you have a conversation different than when you don't know stuff. That's almost like you you trying to have a conversation with somebody in France about football. Well, we're talking about, we call it soccer. They call it football. I can't have a conversation about European football because I don't know anything about it. But if you had somebody sat me down and taught me the nuances of it and all those other things, I could have a productive conversation about it. And to me, that's what we've done with systemic racism. We, we put it in a format that people can kind of take it and understand it and say, okay, now I can I can ask different questions now. Now I know how to approach good old Uncle Bob when he says stuff about these things that are going on. And I didn't have any tools to use before. Now I have information. I have tools. I have a different way of having that conversation. And that to me is the greatest value in everything that I've heard from everybody that said anything to me about it has been that, that it's been a very positive experience for me. So what would you say now, because we, we now we've talked about you know, what other people are learning through the podcast. What Was there anything that you guys learned through doing the podcast or something that surprised you or encouraged you? It could be discouraged as well. But I, I'm, you know, was there anything at all that that took you by surprise or? Well, there's a, there was a lot. There were some things that just like, uh, just made me angry, right? So during this podcast, I started listening to audiobooks. So I got the book cast. Uh, the book I really uh, just got into was The Color of Money for the Racial Wealth Gap. That was kind of the initial when we said that was the inspiration for this, Racial Wealth Gap. So Color of Money by Maresha Baradadon. I was listening to that. And I was just like, what? I was just getting really angry. Um, but she basically, in there, basically said Black people had the only, between Blacks and whites, Black people experienced real capitalism which was like, what? Because white people had the New Deal, FHA. Capitalism is all about scruffy hustle, no handouts. That's what capitalism is, right? And white people had the New Deal, FHA, GI Bill, Homestead Act, which were handouts. Black people had to build, make their own boots, make their own bootstraps, 
right? They had capitalism. They had to fight for themselves and then had the barriers of trying to get access to capital and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So learning that was just, and how that book put into my perspective was just like, damn, you know, like really like the new deal, just looking at it that way. Cause you know, learning school, new deal helped everybody. Like, mm -hmm. and then Reggie brought it up and I read it more about it. And I'm just like, the new deal didn't really help only help one group of people. And, mm -hmm. and then I learned more about it. Like there are people talking about having a new deal for black people, like the stuff that we were left out, you know? So that's kind of things I learned. I learned a lot from Reggie. Um, I learned a lot about myself more importantly. And like all the stuff I had to deal with as a kid brought up all these memories, you know, like my first experience of racism was in the school, second grade, I was handing a paper in and I brought up that traumatic experience where I white lady teacher, older white lady handed a paper. I don't remember what the paper was. All I remember under her breath, she said the N word to me at second grade. I never told my parents till later in life, you know? So that was like, that's the thing I learned. I learned a lot about me and I learned about, and I'm a lover of history. I learned a lot about history and all these things. I, <laughs> that just started to just irritate me. Like, why is this not taught in school? You know? Yeah, you know, for me, the, 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 the value that I've gotten out of it is, you know, when I do the interviews with, with Tariq, you know, we talk about all these different things. I don't know what the part that comes after my part is, right? So I don't know what the solution part is. And to me, I've really enjoyed hearing that part because it's a really valuable tool for me to be able to use when I do the work that I do and I go out and I talk to individuals and organizations and institutions. You know, these are some of the tools that you can use. These are some resources because that's, that's what people are always looking for. They're looking for resources. They look like, well, you know, what can I do? How can I become involved? And, and that part of the podcast has really provided a lot of really super duper valuable resources. You know, I think that, you know, all of the people that, that they've had on doing, you know, solution-based stuff, all of them in some way, shape or form have talked about how this is personal for them as well. You know, we talked to Bill Tisdale, you know, I've known Bill for a number of years and he talked about his experience with the Metropolitan Walker Fair Housing Council and many of the other people. The reason that they engage in this is because it's, it's like personal for them. It's like these things are bothering them. And, and for me, I've always been bothered by a lot of stuff that I see in our society. And I want us to live up to the ideals that we tell people that we live by, right? We lie about it, but we don't live that in the real, in the real world, not for everybody. And to me, what I want people to get out of, of the podcast and what I get out of it is just that it's a personal journey that we're all on, right? It's a journey of learning. That's a never ending journey. I, I tell people all the time that I'm learning something new every day. You know, I'm constantly buying new books, listening to new podcasts, uh, watching new documentaries. I'm always trying to learn so that I can share what I learn with people. You know, my wife, my wife could tell you, listen, Reggie, stop buying so many books and start buying some bookshelves. You got too many darn books around this house, right? But it's, it's, it's a constant need to learn because there's new scholarship. You know, there are great academics around the country that are providing us really the, the most up-to-date information on how to address these issues. Uh, how to learn about these issues. And, and to me, that, that's what people need to take out of it is that it's a lifelong journey of learning. And all of us are a product of our lived experience. All of us are. We, we didn't have any control over the neighborhood we grew up in or who we're in our family, any of those things. But we as adults, we can learn to look back at what we learned as a child and say, you know what, maybe some of the things that I was taught maybe weren't right. Maybe I can look at the world in a different way. Maybe I can address people in a different way. Maybe I don't want to live in a neighborhood that's all white. Maybe I don't want to live in a town that has no people other than white people in it. Maybe I want to live in a more diverse uh, environment. And, and those are the types of things, I think, particularly for white people that are incredibly important. 91% of white people, 91% of white people have, like, no friends of color. Right? So you, you can, it's possible as a white person to grow up in America in a town that literally has not a single person of color in it. There's not a single person of color that can say they can grow up in a town that has no white people in it. You know, we, we are always in contact with white people and white people in many cases have very little contact. And so guess what happens? 
the way that you interact with people, the way that you judge people, the way that you think about people is based on the stereotypes of those people, based on what you've seen on television, what you read in the newspaper, what you've seen in bad Hollywood movies, what you've seen on bad Hollywood uh, TV shows. And we spread those, those negative images of people of color around the entire world. You don't have to be an American. You don't have to teach it to your children. Your children are going to learn it by living in America. I, I like to tell the story of being in Sydney, Australia years ago in a little pub in Sydney, Australia, when I was in the Navy, small group of us, African-Americans, went in the pub, having, having a good time with some Australian guys, right? And for those of you who remember the Fat Albert Show, there was a character on Fat Albert Show that was called Munchmouth. And he's like, ah, oh, but do, but right? You know, talking like that. So here we are in Sydney, Australia, thousands of miles away from, from California, where our ship was based. And, and one of the guys was like, can you guys talk like that guy from Fat Albert? And we're like, dude, that's that's not a real person. That's a cartoon character. He's like, no, I know, I know black people really talk like that. Come on, talk like that for me. And we're like, dude, it's a cartoon character. Bill Cosby made that up. Nobody talks like that in the real world. But he insisted in, in eventually his friends had to take him home before one of my friends put hands on him, right? But in the end of the day, I thought about that later that night and I was like, man, we we eight thousand miles away from the US and we have people that have never met. American blacks before, but they have this ne negative perception because we spread it around the world. And when people come to the United States from other countries, they already have those negative perceptions and those stereotypes of people of color. They think that black people are a certain way. They think that Latino people are a certain way. They think Native Americans are a certain way. They think Asian Americans are a certain way. And they stereotype white people too, because guess what? All they've seen is just wonderful white people on TV, wonderful white people. Even when you're criminals, you're good. If you're a white person, you can even be a criminal. And we can have, you know, we can have empathy for you as a white criminal, but you're not going to have empathy for any black criminals. So. I'm loath to cut in on what is such a good response. There's so much to say, but there's some really good questions I want us to get to. One is from Maddie Reardon and is actually related to this. It's about whiteness. She says, thanks for this. Oh, no, that's the other one. I want to get to the other one, too, which is very good. Maddie says, when we look at data, whiteness is often seen as the norm and issues and topics are always brought back in comparison to that norm. Is this harmful? And how do we start to change the narrative around data and what is quote unquote standard? Maddie? Well, you know, I, I think as we, as we think about what America is, right? I want everybody to do this tonight. I want you to Google all American boy and look for images. And I guarantee you every pitch will be a white guy. So when we think of America, and when we think of Americans, people think that American means white because it's always been white because white has always been the norm for everything. Everything has always been compared to white people, right? And so what happens is in our minds, in our unconscious minds, we are constantly in a state of comparing everybody else to whites. And this is one of the things that I think is really valuable for all of us. If you study people of color, you take the time out of your day to study people of color, like I've done. I've studied Native American history, Asian American history, Latino American history. I've even studied white ethnic groups. And this is what I've discovered. I've learned more about white people than I would have ever learned otherwise. You cannot go through the experiences of people of color without learning about white people, right? And I call this uh, parallel learning, learning the history of people. So when you talk about the American Revolution, right, you're not just talking about the colonists who were there. You're not just talking about the British troops who were there. You're talking about the Africans who were enslaved there. You're talking about the Native Americans who were being slaughtered and having their land taken. You look at what was going on in every community at the same time, and you get a much more nuanced understanding. And then, guess what? You don't see America as just white anymore because people of color have been excluded from everything we learn that obviously white people are going to be the norm for everything we think about because, you know, people, people have asked me, well, you know, I'm really upset that you have Black History Month. Like, really? You got 11 months of White History Month, actually 12 months of White History Month, because most schools don't teach anything about Black History and Black History Month. You're upset that we have one little month the short that month. we actually created, right? But, but see, month. I think we need to understand, Black History Month started as Negro History Week. Carter G. Woodson, first Black to receive a PhD from Harvard, called Negro History Week an attempt to begin to talk about Blacks in history, not Black history, but Blacks in history because we have been excluded. And so the fact that we are now including people of color is bothering white people because it's like, well, you're pushing us aside. No, we're moving you aside so that you can see us because guess what? In all of those stories in history class, we were somewhere in the background. 
you didn't hear about this stuff going in the background. So we're simply bringing our stories to the forefront. And, and as people do that now, white can't be normal anymore. And one of the things that bothers the heck out of me, I hate the word minority. I never use the word minority to describe people of color in this country. Because first of all, white people are only 11% of the people on this planet. So you are a minority on the planet. Secondarily, it's not about math. It's not about, oh, a numerical minority. Because California, a majority of people in California are non-white people. Majority of people in Texas are non-white people, right? So what do you do? You create this fancy term that says California is a majority minority state. Because white people don't want to be called a minority. They refuse to refer to themselves as white people are minority in California. They're a minority in Texas, but they won't call themselves a minority group, right? And you know why? Because they know the minority doesn't just mean the mathematical meaning of it. It has a negative connotation. And so when we think about the language that we use, the language is really important. And even the study of whiteness that has grown over the last 20, 30 years, some people now are pushing back against that and saying that that's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing because we study all of these the, the, the disparities and stuff and we study in great detail people of color and their experiences. We better start paying attention to what's going on with white people because systemic racism damages white people too. I, it's not like it's helping white people and, and, and not doing any damage because it's messing them up psychologically, creating a sense that they are superior to everybody else. And when they grow up and they realize they're not superior, then they have psychological issues. It's interesting you, that you think people grow up and learn that they're not superior. But uh, what <laughs> I want to ask a little bit more about this data question, though, because if you don't, if you need if you're saying the whites shouldn't be the, the, the normal category, and I, I agree with you, but then what do you do when you're trying to measure things like, you know, health? What, what are the benchmarks for like, you know, because we're, when we look at disparities, we're measuring between like, you know, like when we look at the wealth gap or we look at like health oh, yeah. with different things, you, we're trying to use white people as the benchmark because of the, yeah. the relatively better health and better advantages that they have. So is there a way right. to, to where is there a way to talk about where you know discriminated against groups not mm -hmm. minorities um but is there a way to talk uh, talk about how where do you put how do you measure what you're trying to get to if you don't have a benchmark or some other group who who has those advantages if you're not using that as a benchmark well i, I think it's great to to have you know where white people are as a benchmark that doesn't mean it has to be the norm, though, because when, when, when I think of norm, I think of this like, you know, the, the, the standards of beauty, the standards of beauty for years in America was a white woman, a blonde white woman. Right. So, no, the standard of beauty doesn't have to be that uh, the, the standard of, 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 of how we live our lives in terms of uh, the, the things that we care about. His uh, whites have always had the advantage of, you know, the white middle class people, especially over the last 60 years the way that they live their lives is the way everybody else is supposed to live their lives. And if you're not living your life in that way, then something's wrong with you, right? You're not living up to the norm. So I think it's great that we use whites as a baseline because this is, this is what we have to understand. Had we had a level playing field in America from the beginning, then you would not have these gaps. The gaps only exist because the playing field has never been level. And the only way to get the, to get the, the, the gaps to disappear is to put some measures in place that white people don't want to have in place, that, that, that give people of color an advantage. This, this is what I say. When people ask me, well, how can, we, how can we fix these disparities, Reggie? I say, you do the same thing for people of color that you've done for white people. Give them advantages. You know what? I, 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 listen, white people do not have the home ownership rate they have had it not been for the FHA and the VA giving them loans and not giving it to, to people of color. So now when we create something like affirmative action, the white people get mad about it. That's unfair. That's reverse racism. That's nonsense. It's nonsense because what we're trying to do is level the playing field because you've had it so unlevel for so long, but you didn't see that it was unlevel. It looked normal to you. It looked like it's perfectly okay. But for people of color, when you're on the other end of the field and you're looking up, you realize it's not level. So you have to put things in place to mitigate the unlevel playing field that's existed for so many centuries in this country. And the only way to do it is to put policies and practices in place that now give people of color the same advantages that you gave white people. And white people didn't complain about getting those advantages. I didn't hear any white people saying, man, don't give me that FHA loan because it's unfair that you're not giving it to black people. 
give people of color the same advantages because guess what? When you look at what happens when we are given opportunities, look at Major League Baseball. Look at what happened when, when we when we so so called integrated Major League Baseball. And believe me, Jackie Robinson didn't integrate baseball. He integrated one baseball team, right? That's first of all. But when black people had an opportunity, look at the history books for baseball now. Look at the record books. Black names all over those record books because we're given an opportunity. So when we're given opportunities, then you don't have to worry about the playing field being level because opportunity is is what we need what we've been asking for and white people are just constantly pushing back against giving us an opportunity to step our foot in the door when 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 they've been inside the building the whole time i just wanted to do a quick time check with maureen if uh, are yeah. we we don't we have, have any more time for questions or we have one more question that i'd really like us to get to and maybe that can be the cap this question comes from morgan and Morgan says, thanks for this talk. I taught intro to African-American studies for four years at UW Oshkosh and related to your discussion of what students learn and don't, e.g. reconstruction. She says, Gen Z seems to have a great handle on protesting online and in person. They seem to get that Fox News is dangerous, that boomers are toxic. I might say can be toxic, <laughs> but I take your point. Um, but, Generational change is slow. Boomers, maybe Xers, write the textbooks. They buy them, they report and write the news, they hold positions of authority. How can we help bridge these truly deep ethical philosophical differences in approaching the news, consumption of media, and most importantly, recognizing the need for anti-racism pedagogies and practices among generations? I would say the biggest thing, the problem is, one problem is, is social media, right? getting away from that as a news source, right? People share stories without knowing the source, knowing anything. And that's the younger generation. That's the older generation. That's generation X. All of them share those stories. I see it all the time. I'm like, what? And I go Google it. I'm like, no one's covering this. Why would you share this? Like someone shared about they're trying to tear down the bronze bonds. That was an onion story. And they were like upset. I'm like, <laughs> did you like really think this is real? <laughs> And I go there I'm like, well, they should tell them they should say they're a fake news, like a joke site. I'm like, it says in that little I button on Facebook. Right. We need just like Reggie, we need education about black people. We need education about media and journalism yeah. and how and I think that's important. Like there's people and sources trying to push that as an education of learning about finding real sources and learning about what's true or what's not. It's so easy to see a headline and share it. I think that's the key right there is like educate people, all generations about news and journalism and facts, right? I think that's, and we haven't done that in schools, college, high school, whatever, based off what people are sharing. Like, it's ridiculous. People just share a story and like, did you even check it? Did you even read the story? Half the time people didn't read the story. And then you get in this argument about a headline that's from an Onion article, right? So that's that's what I think needs to happen. Yeah, you know, I, I think one of the critical mistakes we've made as a nation with education is we don't teach critical thinking skills. We don't teach children how to critically think. We don't teach them how to analyze things and think about them and come up with their own way of, of, of analyzing and, and perceiving things, right? We tell them, no, this is the correct answer. This is the only right answer. No, there could be multiple right answers depending on your perspective. And so what happens is we grow into adulthood not having a clue how to critically think. Because guess what? We don't have to critically think. We can turn on you know, the radio and we have talking heads that are, that are doing the thinking for us, right? We can, we can see stuff on social media. And we listen, anybody knows anything about social media and the way kind of the 24 hour news cycle works is that it's a bunch of clickbait. It's a headline that's trying to capture your attention, right? It, half the time I see stuff and it's, you know, the headline and then you read the article and the article has nothing to do with the headline says, right? Or they'll say, you know, they're going to show you a video of somebody doing something, right? So, you know, some kid slipping on a banana peel or something. So you're like, oh, that'll be kind of funny, right? And then you click and it's like, there's a video of something different. So you don't even know what you're getting. And because people are so immersed in, you know, getting information very quickly and not thinking about it, they share stuff. It's like, oh, I like that headline. Let me share it. Social media is like the best thing ever created because it can connect millions of people, billions of people 
but it's the worst thing because it, it can connect people <laughs> with ideas that prevent them from really using their brains. Because and, and, and how the algorithm works, the great document Netflix, the perennial, the uh, social dilemma. Yeah. Uh, basically yeah. like you're basically in an echo chamber. So you read all the stuff you think that's, and that's why you like, you say the other side, they're stupid and crazy. Why don't they see this? Because guess what? They're not seeing it because they're getting things mm -hmm. that fits their echo chamber because that's how the algorithms work. And here's yeah. the systemic racism of the social media that most people realize in that documentary. The people who created it without thinking about the ethics, they were all white men. So mm -hmm. again, the whole idea of what social media algorithms are built by, white men not thinking about how would other people, diverse people would think and use this platform. So we get what we are with social media because of systemic racism. Yeah. You know, garbage in, garbage out was what I learned in computer concepts class when I was in ninth grade. Garbage in, garbage out. And that's exactly what we're getting from social media. You, you put garbage in, you build algorithms with biases built into them. I mean, not just in, in how social media does it, but a lot of the algorithms that police departments are using, that prison systems are using, you know, all these different things. These algorithms have built in biases, right? And we talk about artificial intelligence. Listen, there's no such thing as artificial intelligence unless some human being creates it. So if the human created it, it's not really artificial, it's real, right? So we can talk about how we consume stuff. And as you said, the algorithms, they're gonna give you more of what you tune into. So if you like watching, you know, little videos of, of people slipping on a banana peel, then you'll get more videos of people slipping on a banana peel, right? You're gonna get consistent reinforcement. This, 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 this bias that you have, you're gonna get consistent reinforcement of that. And you're never gonna see the other side of it. And like, I'm, like, I love, like I love cats, for example. I don't see any yep. dog videos. I love right. kittens. I think dogs right. are terrible because of what the algorithm fits. Exactly. And that's what people don't get. They don't understand why they're not seeing the other side. It's because guess what? You're never going to be exposed to the other side because everything you're getting is from one side. And there, there's an interesting documentary about this. And I can't remember the name of it, but it was a young woman who was concerned about her dad watching Fox News all the time and, and becoming more and more conservative in his views and, and very racist and stuff, right? So she said, I'm going to control what he watches. So she started making him watch other stuff. And he started actually, guess what? Using his brain and thinking like differently than he thought before. If you're constantly exposed to one side or the other, and I'm not saying that Fox is bad and CNN is good or whatever, you know, whatever you prefer. But I'm just saying, if you are not having a more nuanced, stream of information coming into your brain and you don't have the ability to process that and critically think, then you're gonna be stuck in the same place for the rest of your life. You're never gonna be able to have constructive conversation. You're gonna be mad, you're gonna be defensive and nothing will ever change because systems are in place and they're designed to maintain the status quo. People don't create a system that benefits them to the detriment of other people and then all of a sudden come in and disassemble that system. It doesn't work that way. Malcolm X said this a long time ago. He said, you can't go to the head of the foxes and tell him to tell the rest of the foxes to stop eating the chickens because it's never going to work. And that's literally what we're fighting against. We're fighting against a system that really benefits white people. And they don't really have a whole lot of incentive to disassemble the system because they're loving the benefits of it. Can I, um, I, I imagine we're almost out of time, right, Maureen? I wonder if I have time to just ask one follow-up question. Yes. Which is, if you were to do a part two, season two, sequel of um, this series of By Every Measure, what would it be, what would it look like? What are the questions that you would want to ask? Um, what are the systems that you would want to look at? Mine, it would start off the racial wealth gap. Like that, like I said before, I got a rabbit hole of racial wealth gap, and that really leads to a lot of problems as well. I would love to go deeper than that. I mean, after reading The Color of Money, um, I was so fascinated by the history of all that and how the racial wealth gap affected housing, affected entrepreneurship and all that. I would love to do a part two on the racial wealth gap because I think just seeing how that's just getting worse and worse, and that also affects a lot of things, right? Housing, the generation, like, Ability to pay for colleges. Like I, we, we had a, a, a panel, Maddie had a panel with Andre Perry of Know Your Price, the book talking about like the loss of value from the, uh, black homes, $156 billion of devalued homes and neighborhoods that could pay for like, I forgot, like 8 million four year scholarships at uh, public schools or 4.4 business, 4.4 million business could have been started 
by that loss of value, right? To me, that fascinates me. And the fact that I learned that Citigroup said, you know, racism has caused America to lose basically $16 trillion of value, right? So I would love to go deeper in the racial wealth gap. Yeah, and I, I think it's incredibly valuable to dig into the, the racial wealth gap because guess what? A lot of stuff that we're talking about, just follow the money. You follow the money and you'll see where the advantages and the disadvantages come from. And, and, and you, you, you see it most importantly, generationally. That's the important part. Generational wealth. Most Americans' wealth is in home ownership, right? It's not in your stock portfolio, you know, your bank account, the Bitcoin somebody convinced you to buy two years ago. It's in your house. And because white people have had this huge advantage, the, the wealth gap is really about the gap in the value of our homes, the gap in, in the home ownership rate. And when you have the ability as a white family to pass down that wealth from generation to generation, guess what happens? you have a built-in advantage that people of color have not had. I can't go back and say that my great-grandfather was able to, to, to buy a home in Mississippi because he couldn't get a loan. He had to build his own house from the ground up, right? He couldn't get a bank loan to build it. White people are, take it for granted in many cases, not every white person, but a lot of white people take it for granted that they're going to be a homeowner when they become an adult, right? Black people, we don't think about that when we're a kid. We just think we're going to have a, hopefully have a roof over our head, but we're not going to have our parents give us the down payment to buy our house, right? They're not going to give us the money that they borrowed a home equity loan to pay for us to go to college. That's not going to happen for us because we have not had enough generations of Black people that have been able to access that wealth building tool to be able to be in that position. It's going to take us hundreds of years to catch up at the pace we're going now. Thank you so much. I think we got to cap it there. There's one additional question actually from Sarah. She's asking what the most promising um, organizations are that are doing work in Milwaukee to kind of combat some of these things. But I might just suggest that she check out the Buy Every Measure page because I think you list a lot of the places that you talk to. Yeah, Is we that have a resource tool that you can sign up. We have a resource guide for every episode. That you can sign up and get like all the details, everything we talked about, all the links, books, and that kind of stuff. Great. That's awesome. I want to thank each of you so much. This is, I mean, it's such a scary time right now. This has been a very heartening talk in some ways for me to just hear about, to hear it like it is and to have people who are invested in change. I, I really appreciate um, all of you, Tariq, Reggie, Anika, for taking the time today. Um, thank you. Yes, and just and one final note, we have a talk, we do a series same time every Friday, almost every Friday. And next week, uh, we're co-sponsoring a talk called Reimagine Everything, How Insurgent Aesthetics and Queer Collective Care Are Transforming Our Worlds. It's uh, by Ronak Kapadia, he's a professor at UIC. He's talking about the queer brown Midwest as a place of queer care ethics and um, resistance. And I think it's going to be great. It's next week at this time, 3.30 on our YouTube channel. Great. I want to thank Tariq and Reggie too. It was great. And let's think of this as a beginning, uh, not an end. So thanks for joining us. Awesome. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Anika, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great. You know, we could do this for hours and hours <laughs> and hours. You know, I, I wish we had more time to be perfectly honest with you because there's so much to talk about, so much to delve into. Uh, um, and I look forward to continuing. And I ask for a studies departmental yeah. series and, and do a part two if you like. Oh, cool. great. I love it. <laughs> that would be great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. You too. Thank Take you care, Maureen.